everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. As often happens on Chef AJ Live, one guest is referred by another. And if you remember the wonderful plant-based dietitian who specializes in kidney disease, Jen Moore, when she came on the show, you guys loved the topic and you said, hey, can you get us a doctor that specializes in kidney disease? Well, yes, I can. And his name is Dr. Shivam Joshi. And he's here to talk about kidney disease and plant-based diets. Please welcome him to the show. Thanks for taking the time. I know we're doing this late because you worked all day, so I, I, I extra appreciate it. Oh, no problem. I appreciate being on here and uh, and to be able to talk about my favorite topic, which is diets and kidney disease. Before we even talk about that, could you tell us a little bit about you? Like, where do you practice? Can people see you? Why are you passionate about kidneys? And why are you even interested in a plant-based diet in general? Well, I love I love food, and uh, so that's how I got into diets and kidney disease. And I've actually I've uh, been plant based for a decade now, and so I of course wanted to combine the two interests. And I practice here at the Orlando VA, so unfortunately I only can only see uh, veterans, those who have served, and I love what I do. I used to work at NYU in Bellevue uh, with some uh, people that you've had before, like the uh, famous Dr. Michelle McMacken and Lily Correa uh, and that whole group. And uh, I loved working with them, starting the plant-based lifestyle clinic there. But now I've uh, moved closer to family here in Florida, and uh, that's why I've had to, to relocate. But I still incorporate lifestyle uh, in, in almost every day with what I do with my patients because it's really important. Now you say you work with, with the, at the VA. So are are your patients generally a lot older? They are a lot older. They they tend to be, but I do see a lot of younger folks too. Because I'm wondering, you know, I, I find that sometimes it's very difficult to ch- get people to change their diet at any age. And I'm thinking if they're kind of older, like they might be a little bit more set in their ways. So are they open to what you are trying to teach them about plant-based diets? Some people are very open. I just saw a gentleman today who is in his 60s, and but he was very receptive to making changes because it meant keeping him off of dialysis. So there, so even though people are set in their ways, when they are faced to, with dialysis, they are motivated to uh, make changes. Yeah, I, I, I used to work at a retirement home and my job on Saturdays when the regular driver was off is I drove people to dialysis and they would just come back. They'd be so wiped out, so yeah. tired. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is tiring and it, it's not a great treatment. And uh, people think that dialysis is just the same as having a kidney, but it's not. Um, When you're on dialysis, your body is slowly uh, deteriorating uh, because it's not the same as having a kidney and people are wiped out. They don't have energy and a lot of people can't keep working or they can't stay in school. They have a hard time taking care of their families. So uh, it's really important to try and stay off dialysis for as much as you can. Yeah, absolutely. So what 10 years ago happened that made you adopt a plant-based diet? Well, I read the China study. Um, uh, so at that time, the China study was the the big thing. And uh, I, I learned a lot. And as a physician, I had not uh, learned any of this in medical school. So that's the crazy part about this. Um, and when you when you go through medical school, you don't get any of this teaching. And, uh, you know, I'm sure your listeners probably know this, that their doctors just aren't taught this. They don't discuss it. And that was the same way. The things I learned about were scurvy. I've never seen a case of scurvy. Uh, and, uh, and you can only get a few hours and that's about it. So someone told me to read the China study. I read it and then I started double checking the references and that led me to another book and another book. And, uh, and, you know, I was hooked. So I initially became a vegetarian. Then I became completely plant-based. I became a vegan and, uh, that's the life that I live. I don't recommend all my patients to go, uh, completely vegan because the, standard American diet is so unhealthy that even just moving along the spectrum can make big changes. And uh, I support people where they are. Um, But of course, if someone wants to go completely plant-based or they want to go in a particular direction, I try and help them uh, so long as that it's uh, helping their health and not harming them. So what is it about the standard American diet that is particularly deleterious for people that maybe have kidney disease? Is it the high amount of animal products? Is it the processed food? Is it both? So what is good for kidneys? What is not so good for kidneys? It's everything. It is, uh, it, it is, it's everything. It's the, it's the lack of the fiber, the lack of the, um, uh, healthy fats. It's the excess of calories. It's the processing. It's the high sodium, the lack of the 
potassium in the diet. Uh, it's a lot, uh, it's, it's a little bit of everything, the saturated fat, uh, the refined carbohydrates, uh, everything about it contributes in some way to make the life of the kidney a little bit harder. So when you switch to a plant-based diet, things become, uh, become easier. Uh, and in the protein too, the animal protein has a lot of effects, which people don't think about. People think of animal protein as being high in biological value. It's uh, bioavailable. It gets absorbed. It has a lot of amino acids, especially the essential amino acids, but it actually causes more work for the kidney compared to plant protein. Animal protein also tends to be high, have more bioavailable phosphorus and as, tends also to have more acid. And that becomes a problem for patients who have kidney disease because the phosphorus and the acid accumulates. So for my patients with kidney problems, I tell them to eat more plant-based because it can help them make the life of their kidneys easier and also help uh, reduce the amount of medications they ultimately have to take. Well, when, you know, I always hear about people I mean, that I've known that are either on a waiting list for a new kidney or on dialysis, and they're told, I believe, to be like on a low protein diet at that point. Is that correct? Yeah. So some, some patients are on a low protein diet and that's actually some of the research that uh, I do. And I've worked with uh, Dr. Cam Kalantar, who's out there in California. And uh, the idea behind a low protein diet is that you're reducing basically how hard the kidneys work. So the more protein you eat, the harder the kidneys work. When you do a low protein diet, kidneys work less but you don't want to completely cut out all the protein. You need some protein for life to sustain the, your metabolic functions, your human needs. So you need some protein. So that's why they call it a low protein. That's generally about 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. Uh, some people do even go lower, but they're supplemented with amino acids. Uh, but for patients that are in that situation, if kidney disease, uh, low protein is better. You definitely don't want to be uh, you know, uh, someone that's overdoing it, doing two grams uh, per kilogram per day, because that's what causes uh, trouble. It can cause hyperfiltration, which revs the kidneys up, and that causes the kidneys to deteriorate faster over time. And so many people, especially when they're new to adopting a plant-based diet, or if they're an athlete, worry about getting more and more protein. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we we are fixated on protein, and people have written books about it. And I tell people that if you don't have kidney disease, eating all that protein probably won't cause a problem, but you really want to be sure that you don't have kidney disease. So if you're one of those people that has never seen a doctor, you don't like seeing doctors, do yourself a favor, go to your primary care doctor, your PCP, your general doctor, and just get a routine blood test, urine test to make sure you don't have kidney disease because you don't want to be in a situation where maybe you had something genetic or familial or something that happened in childhood and that got missed and now you have kidney disease and you're doing all this protein for years and years and then you end up in with a problem. That that's that's a bad situation. So just and everyone should be seeing their doctor as a matter of routine. We've kind of become a culture where we just go into urgent care when we need to, and we don't do those routine visits anymore, but it's so important to do that. What is kidney disease? Yeah, that's a great question. So the kidneys, the best way I can explain it is that every time you go to the bathroom and you urinate, the kidneys are making that urine. When, when you have kidney disease, when it's severe, that urine accumulates in your blood. So that happens in really advanced kidney disease. So you can imagine the urine floating around in your blood, and that's not a good feeling. All those toxins, the uh, salt, uh, electrolytes, all these things that you don't need, uh, they float around. When you have kidney disease, this happens incrementally, and there's five stages. When you get to stage five, which is the worst, uh, that's when your doctor will start talking about dialysis. Wow. What is the number one cause of kidney disease, at least in the United States? Well, the number one cause you could say probably is a standard American diet, which encompasses all of the causes really, but truly the number one cause is diabetes. Diabetes is such a scourge in societies that causes so many complications from heart disease to strokes, people losing their arms and legs. Uh, it causes a lot of problems. And another problem that it causes is kidney disease. The number one cause of Kidney disease and kidney failure is diabetes, and a large proportion of diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, is preventable through eating uh, a healthy diet, but too many of us are just conditioned to eat a fiber-poor, resource-poor, uh, nutrient-poor uh, standard American diet. Yeah. So 
talk a little bit about kidney transplants, because I once heard Dr. McDougall say that if you are going to even give somebody one, you better go vegan. Like if you're going to live with one kidney, that's the really the time to do it. Yeah. So I, I think, uh, so eating a, uh, eating a completely plant-based diet or even a mostly plant-based diet, uh, has a lot of benefits. It reduces the risk of the number one cause of kidney disease, which is diabetes. So if you're going to give a kidney, you definitely don't want to develop the causes of kidney failure because you really want to hold on to that one kidney. If someone can live with one kidney just fine, assuming that they don't have diabetes or high blood pressure. Once you start developing those, it's a slippery slope, especially if those become uncontrolled uh, and they la stay there for a long time. And that's how people develop uh, kidney disease and they move through the stages and then ultimately on dialysis. And that's something you don't want to go down. Uh, eating a healthy plant-based diet helps reduce your risk of developing diabetes and hypertension. If you have it, it helps treat it and it reduces the effects of it. So there's a lot of advantages regardless of where you are. So eating plant-based is really helpful. Another thing is that generally people who eat plant-based don't eat a whole lot of protein. When you look at the studies, people who eat plant-based compared to omnivores tend to eat less protein. They're not protein deficient. They just eat less protein because so many people on a standard American diet are already overdoing the protein. They eat so much protein, they're overdoing it. They're way past where they need to be for that recommendations. So when you eat plant-based, you're getting more fiber and more carbohydrates, healthy carbohydrates instead of the protein, and that's better for your kidneys. Yeah, and yet that's always, you know, I've been vegan for almost 50 years, and that's the number one thing. People are like, where am I going to get my protein, you know? Yeah. How does a person even know they have kidney disease? Is it, you know, like a lot of times they call heart disease the silent killer? What is, how does kidney disease usually manifest for people? Yeah, so for for uh, kidney disease, it's actually, this is an unfortunate part, is that most people don't know about it until it's really, really late, unless you get a blood test. And this is why I said earlier that you want to check it with your, your primary care doctor to get a blood test and a urine test just to make sure you don't have kidney disease. Can you, you need both of those tests to really be sure. The blood tests one aspect of kidney function, and then the urine tests another aspect of kidney function, and you need both to really be sure. And I've seen people many times, unfortunately, where they come in and they the, their first encounter with the physician is when they start dialysis, that their disease is so advanced. And uh, you know that's not something we want for anyone. Sorry about that. I accidentally muted myself. Once a patient has kidney disease, is it ever reversible? Or like, for example, if they're on dialysis, is it ever reversible to some degree? For some people, it can be. It depends on the situation. So like, for example, sometimes people get so dehydrated after a GI bug, like they get diarrhea, like norovirus or something, and they can't take it, keep anything down, and they're losing a lot of fluids, and they get really dehydrated, and their kidney function goes way down. In some situations, people need to be on dialysis for that. Uh, it's not always, but then they come off of it once they get the IV fluids and they get rehydrated. And after a few weeks, they, uh, for some of them, they go back to where they were. Or some people are left with some uh, impairment in their kidney function, but at least they're able to get off dialysis. That's a minority of folks. I would say the vast majority of people generally are on a one-way street where the kidney function is slowly deteriorating over time. And that deterioration, unfortunately, is not reversible. And then people progress to being on uh, dialysis permanently. Yeah. You know, you talked about the, the, the job, the kilties, the kilties, the kidneys can't talk today. And one of the viewers wrote in a question saying, um, what is your recommendation for how much water to drink? There's many different recommendations. Some recommend 96 ounces, some recommend less. What do you think is optimal for kidney health? And what is the best water filtration method? Yeah, that's a good question. The the best way to best way to gauge it on a personal level is to try and keep your urine on the clear side or light yellow. If your urine is coming really dark yellow, orange or brown or really concentrated, that is you're not taking in enough water. For most people, the amount of water to take in is probably between two to three liters of water per day. However, some people need to restrict water for certain reasons. If they have a low sodium level or if they have heart failure, liver failure, or kidney problems, then they'll need to uh, follow the directions of their doctors. But for the average person, we're looking at two to three liters. Now, if you are someone that's really active outside, sweating a lot, you're a construction worker outside, and you're losing a lot of water through sweat, you may actually need to drink more than that. Here in Florida, I see a lot of people with kidney stones. They tell me they drink two to three liters 
but they are they work as a, a mailman or they're a construction worker or they're doing something outside and then so they need to actually drink even more than that just to keep up with all the water that they're losing in terms of best filtration i would say it's really kind of up to you and what you can um, afford i think it's reasonable to uh, get some sort of filtration in most places uh, just to remove whatever contaminants are in there. And if you're unsure, you, there's uh, opportunities for even free testing. For example, I know some Home Depot locations do free water testing. Interesting. What, what causes kidney stones? I know so many people, even healthy vegans that have them. Yeah, it's a great question. And it goes back to the standard American diet. The standard American diet causes so many problems. Uh, it's the, uh, ever, uh, and they, they've done, they've done studies on this uh, going back to world war II when people's diet started to change and people started moving from kind of a more agrarian type of, uh, lifestyle to moving into the city and it, everyone was getting a Western diet. We started to see this increase in kidney stones. And a lot of it is attributable to eating a lot of salt and also eating a lot of animal protein. So going back to the animal protein, Animal protein has a lot of acid, and that increases the risk of kidney stones. Eating a lot of salt increases the risk of kidney stones because it increases the amount of calcium in your urine. People don't realize that. And then a lot of people just don't drink enough water. That's a big thing too. It's so simple, but I get a lot of folks that say they don't like the taste of water, and then they end up, they find themselves having kidney stones. But uh, you can change the taste of water by adding a couple of squeezes of lime or a lemon or a cucumber slices to, to make it palatable. And, uh, and then eating fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables are natural stone, kidney stone um, prevention foods. Uh, and people just don't eat enough of it. We um, uh, don't eat enough servings of fruits and vegetables to, to take the benefit of them. Yeah. So is um, once somebody has one, is there, what do you recommend they do? I, it's probably better to just try to avoid them, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good idea to avoid them. Uh, 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 unfortunately, uh, a no growing percentage of the population is ha are having kidney stones. It's more than 10% of the population at some point will have a kidney stone. And uh, that number is increasing as unfortunately, people, more people eat more unhealthy and the climate is warming, which also contributes to people having kidney stones and people are also getting busier. So it's harder to eat healthier and stay hydrated. Uh, but if you have kidney stones, the big four things I tell people are to drink more water, which we've kind of already talked about, to eat fruits and vegetables with every meal, and to reduce the amount of animal protein intake, and by extension, also increase the amount of plant protein intake. And then the last thing is to reduce the amount of salt people are consuming. And most people already tell me that they don't eat salt, they don't add salt, but what they don't realize is the salt is already being added for them by uh, the factory that made their food or the restaurant that they're going to. So I tell them to kind of get away from those and eat whole fruits and vegetables and make their own food. So that way, you know how much what's going in it and you're not being surprised by a salt load. I've heard from people that have had kidney stones that it's in the hierarchy of things that are painful. It's, it's one of the tops, like even worse than pr delivering a baby or having a baby, not delivering. A baby. It's pretty painful as someone who's had a kidney stone myself. I can personally attest to uh, how painful it is. And I, I had it myself in high school when I was eating a lot of TV dinners and eating extremely unhealthy. Uh, but ever since I changed my diet and I've, I have not had a kidney stone since, uh, eating healthier and staying more hydrated, but it's extremely painful. It's disabling. Did, did how long did you suffer? I suffered for a few hours until I passed it. I actually had to go to the emergency room. I had to get morphine. Uh, and it's crazy because that I was in high school at the time. And now here I am as a kidney doctor. And I understand the experience when people tell me how painful it is. And I, I can empathize with them. That is so interesting. So this was before you were plant based. So do, do yeah, I love that that you, like you know what it, you, when they say it hurts, you're like yeah, it really does. I know, and it's a memory that sticks with you because even though it was 20 years ago, I still remember how painful it was. It's uh, it's it's one of the most painful things a person can go through. Now I can't compare it to childbirth because I've never given a child and will never have that experience. But for me as a man, it uh, it's very painful. What was your diet like back then? Was it just your, your typical standard American diet? Was it maybe a little bit better than other people? 
So at that time in high school, I was uh, trying to bulk up. Uh, I was told that if I gained a little bit more weight, I could be uh, I could join the football team. And being the young, naive person that I was, uh, you know, I just did what other people were doing. Their people were eating a lot of calories and protein. So I got that from the TV dinners that you get in the frozen section, which in retrospect is some of the unhealthiest food that you could eat because it's very processed. It's high in sodium. It's animal protein. Uh, but at that time, I, I didn't know better. And I was like many people. And uh, it didn't take very long for me to have a kidney stone. And of course, I did not uh, 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 pursue the the football team uh, with that with my build. Uh, I ended up uh, and going on the swim team. But uh, uh, lesson learned. Uh, um, hey, you can develop a kidney stone pretty quickly. Wow. Well, I'm glad you are better now because that's <laughs> Thank terrible. You. You know, this is going to be sound like a weird question, but I always wondered, why is urine yellow? Yeah, that's a good question. So the reason for that, is, it's a little complex, is that you have hemoglobin and that hemoglobin gets metabolized and then ends up in the bile, uh, which is the gallbladder. Gallbladder secretes bile to help digest uh, uh, food, particularly fat. And then that bile ultimately gets digested in the gut further and then gets absorbed and then ultimately gets excreted in the urine and comes out as being yellow. Um, so it's a little complicated, but, uh, that's the, the real reason it's urobilinogen that is what's, uh, uh, coming out or urobilin. Interesting. But it, you want, you don't want it like really dark yellow, but should it be a little bit faint? Cause if urine is totally clear, is that too much water? It could be too much water or it could be just the right amount, depending on your situation. For some people who have kidney disease, getting it to that clear could be too much. And you might start developing swelling in the legs, which is called edema. But uh, for most people, it, it actually is fine. So if it's like, a, so if it's, well, I say to, from clear to light yellow, you're okay. If it's that super yellow uh, or orange, then that, that's a problem. Got it. Okay. Um, I'm curious, how much water do you drink a day? <laughs> <laughs> I, drink, I try and drink a lot. I'm a thirsty person. And uh, like I said, I had that experience with the kidney stone and that's something that I never want to have again. So I'm pretty mindful and I always have water. I even have water here with me. I have it with me right now. And I keep uh, those uh, metal canisters when I go to work. Exactly. Me too. I think it helps having a purple bottle. It just makes it <laughs> more, much more enticing. So yeah, I did my first water fast a few weeks ago. And interestingly enough, they don't want you to just drink tons. I mean, they want you to drink, but it's like, I thought it was going to have to be, you know, they said, as long as you get 40 ounces, because you're not, you're laying in bed, you're not doing yeah, yeah. anything. So yeah. it was really, really interesting. Like that was the most exciting thing you get to do on a water fast is actually get up and walk to the bathroom. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's about it for, for me that, you know, what about things like um, phosphate? You hear people on the, like kidney diets, you hear them talk about phosphate a lot. Yeah. So phosphate's a, a big problem. So the reason it's a problem and it's the reason, um, and one of the reasons that a lot of people don't know it's a problem is because phosphate's not on the labels. It's, you know, you see sodium, you see potassium, you see calories, fat, but uh, phosphorus isn't, uh, isn't on there. And for people with kidney disease, the phosphorus in those foods accumulates. And when we do blood tests, that phosphorus level is really high. And it's something that I, I was dealing with it uh, several times today. I had a few folks with high phosphorus levels. And the common treatment for it is to give pills to bind the phosphorus to bring it down. But what people may not know is that eating plant-based, you can actually reduce your phosphorus as well, because a lot, even though plant foods have a lot of phosphorus, it's not bioavailable, meaning that it's not absorbed. So by switching to a plant-based diet, you can actually potentially reduce your phosphorus level in those situations. That's interesting. And what about, what's the other thing? Uh, potassium rich. Potassium. Are, are potassium. People, people, a lot of times with kidney disease, they're told to avoid them. So maybe you could talk about which foods are high in phosphorus and potassium. And is it true they have to avoid a potassium rich food? Yeah. So that's changing a lot. So that when I was in training, when I was in med school and residency and fellowship and all that, the, the training teaching was that these patients had to avoid uh, phosphorus rich foods and potassium rich foods. What we've learned is that for phosphorus, not all that phosphorus gets absorbed. So for example, beans are high in phosphorus, nuts and seeds are high in phosphorus, but a lot of it doesn't get absorbed. What does get absorbed is the phosphorus and dark, dark sodas. So dark sodas have a lot of phosphorus, uh, not your clear ones like ginger ale, 
but the, the dark ones that are caffeinated, those have a lot of phosphorus. Those get absorbed immediately. A lot of meats, dairies have a lot of phosphorus. And then on the labels, for example, if for anyone that's a kidney patient that's listening, uh, when you look at the labels, it may say phosphorus or phosphoric acid or something like that in the name to suggest that phosphorus was added. And that added phosphorus is 100% bioavailable. It's 100% absorbed. And it, it really shoots up the phosphorus levels in the blood. So those are the things to really pay attention to. For potassium, the old teaching was to avoid bananas, uh, fruits. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that was the old teaching. And that this touches on my area of uh, research and what I do in my uh, papers and the things that I write about is that that's really outdated. What we've seen is that the same issue applies, that all that potassium does not actually get absorbed. And eating a banana is actually really healthy compared to what people um Eight previously. So for patients that had advanced kidney disease, they were on this thing called the renal diet. Renal meaning kidneys are on this uh, kidney diet. And this diet really just emphasized things like white bread, white rice, ham, cheese, um, animal protein. It was really unhealthy just even to even talk about it. And I even had people coming into my clinic eating ham and cheese sandwich because that's what the hospital gave them. And, uh, and then they wouldn't eat a banana because they were told that, oh, bananas are too high in potassium and not to eat a banana. But what we've now learned is that that's not true. And I've been lucky enough to be part of this movement to kind of change what's written in the guidelines to help emphasize eating a healthy plant-based diet, kind of like what you have in the logos behind you, telling people that it's okay to eat fruits and vegetables, even if you have kidney disease, because these are some of the healthiest foods on the planet. And uh, so now there's a entire shift in culture. Uh, there are some people who do need to watch out. There's some foods that are still of concern and those things uh, people need to be mindful of. So I always say to reach out to a dietitian and be under the supervision of a, a dietitian that understands kidney disease, specifically plant-based diets as well. So that way you are making the right changes and not um, getting into any pitfalls. The dietitian like Jen Moore. Exactly, exactly. Absolutely. Let's see. You know, it, it, transplants, what do you think about people that are healthy being donors? I mean, do you think we all should be having that on our driver's license? I, th- I, I, I'm a, I'm a donor myself and I think it's a good thing if, um, uh, uh, if, if you're at the end of the road, literally, and, uh, you have no need for your organs, why take your organs to the afterlife, uh, regardless of uh, what you believe? So for me, it doesn't make any sense to not donate my kidneys. And I've never seen a situation where people, uh, 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 you know, kill someone off just to harvest their organs. That that does not happen in this country. And that's a big fear of people to not be an no, organ donor. I'm going to be honest. My fear, and, you know, I saw a movie when I was younger called Coma. And I saw an episode of the X-Files where they're actually doing that. And my fear is like, they're going to see me and they're like, yeah, she's old anyway. And, you know, she's a donor. So let's just start taking them out. But I know that's crazy, but I, that, that thought does cross my mind too much TV, I suppose. <laughs> no, yeah, it's a lot. Of, yeah. I've, I've, I've worked in the healthcare field for almost a decade and a half now, maybe longer. I haven't, I've never seen that. Um, people do everything they can in the hospitals to keep people alive. And it's only at, when it's all said and done to people um, before they, they send someone to call the funeral home, they say, hey, wait a minute, this person actually may have a liver that could go to someone or a heart or a kidney. And then they, you know, they call the organ um, uh, registry folks and then they come and evaluate. Um, but I've, I've never seen it. In other countries, I've heard stories, some crazy stories, but not, not, in, not in the United States, fortunately. I actually know two people that got kidneys. One got from his son and one got one indirectly from his wife. Like his wife wasn't a match. And so what they did is she gave her kidney to somebody else and that moved him way up on the list. Right, right. I've heard that. Yeah, the paired exchange where they, yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. You know, ketogenic diets are all the rage. How are they, in your opinion, in general, but specifically for, you know, people with kidney disease? Yeah, so ketogenic diets are interesting. They've come about recently. They're these intense low-carb diets, and they produce ketones, and they produce acids. Uh, The problem for me with ketogenic diets for my patients with kidney disease is that the acid production can be a lot, and that acid accumulates in the body and can cause problems. So people might have heard of alkaline water. Alkaline is a base. 
acid is the opposite and that acid can wear down on the bones. It can cause the kidneys to deteriorate faster and it can raise potassium levels. It's not a good thing to have. And so for me, uh, then I have to give alkali or uh, prescription alkali, or I have to tell them to eat more alkaline foods, which can be a challenge on the ketogenic diet because a lot of those alkaline foods have carbohydrates uh, to neutralize all that acid. So, so for me, that's the that's the concern with the ketogenic diet uh, for patients with kidney disease. Interesting. But you don't think it's a healthy diet in general, whether they have kidney disease or not, right? Yeah. And I, I've uh, written about that with uh, um, a few people like uh, Rob Osfeld and Michelle McMacken over the years, and uh, we've taken a lot of flack for it. Um, but I, I, when you look at the literature on ketogenic diets, uh, they are not really better compared to other diets. And actually, when you compare them to controlled diets, higher carbohydrate, uh, lower fat diets, uh, in some studies, after 12 months, there's no difference in hemoglobin A1C, uh, blood sugar control, or weight. Um, in other studies, the difference is trivial. Um, so it's not really a slam dunk. And the problem with it is that for some people in the short term, they can lose a lot of weight, but it's hard to sustain in the long term. The ketogenic diet is really restrictive. You end up eating the same few things over and over, and people have a hard time adhering to that. Then they fall off the wagon, and they're back to square one. So what's really the point of being on the diet? Uh, what I tell people is to eat one of the tried and true diets. You can do Mediterranean, you can do DASH, you can do vegetarian, as long as it focuses on a base of whole unprocessed foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, lentils, yada, yada. And you can have your own twist on it. And that, that's what's really going to help you in the long run. What is the food like at the hospital you work at, both for like maybe the people at the cafeteria and the patients? What What is it like? Chef AJ, I'm not trying to get fired today. Okay, okay. So we, <laughs> what, okay. okay. It's, it's, it's bad. It's bad. Um, I, I will rephrase yeah. the question. What does Dr. Joshi eat for lunch? <laughs> Uh, I'm actually re- disappointed in the foods that are, and I think it's reflective of the health system, uh, of the of the food policy in this country. It comes from Washington, and the food policy, and this extends to all government agencies, to our armed forces, to government buildings, to everyone. And the the food that is served is reflective of these national and uh, dietary guidelines, which are subject to strong influence from industry. And that's the unfortunate part. And, and uh, people much smarter than myself, like Marion Nestle, have long written about this, that we need to separate the industry influence on what is important for our health. These guidelines do not need to be written by the agricultural department. What we need is for them to be written by a health department where the sole focus is on health only. And I think that's part of the problem. So what you see in uh, in a, a, any sort of government funded uh, place, cafeteria, uh, you're going to is reflective of probably what people expect in uh, in larger society, you're going to see burgers, you're going to see fries, you're going to see fried chicken, pizza. And these are not really the foods to build a foundation of health. So for me, it's actually very challenging to find good healthy food uh, day after day. So for me, uh, uh, there's a plant based place down the street that I go to sometimes I bring food from home. Uh, sometimes I keep a bunch of snacks in my drawer sometimes just to get through the day and then I come home and eat. Uh, so I do a variety of things. I like to eat salads when I can. Um, and then sometimes when I'm forced to eat in the cafeteria by circumstances, I try and get a bunch of sides with veggies. Nice. Yeah. Good. Um, I'm guessing you eat your breakfast before you go to work. I try to. Um, some days it's uh, it's tough, but uh, for me, bananas have been have saved me. So I, they're like the perfect natural fast food. You get two, three bananas. People have this idea that you can only eat one banana and that's it. I know. I sometimes I'm eating up to four. I mean, if I'm yeah. hungry, usually two is about right. But yeah. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Here, here's a funny question. What would make urine smell like Fritos? <laughs> <laughs> Ask but- that. She doesn't eat any processed food, no chips, hundred. You know, I always thought my pet's paws smelled like Fritos. Like <laughs> that's um yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, I don't I don't know. It must be some product that's being metabolized and coming out in the urine. I don't know exactly what it is, but for example, when I drink coffee, I know that my urine smell changes with based on the coffee. And I think a lot of other people, you know, people say that about asparagus. So the, the foods that we eat are being metabolized and some of those chemicals are coming out in the urine. What that exactly is, I don't know. 
how come when we eat beets, like, I mean, the first, I mean, the, I remember the very first time in my life I ate beets, I thought I was dying. Nobody tells you that it yeah. makes your urine pink or red. Why, why would, why does it do that? I think it's the pigment in the beets. Um, don't hold me to it, but uh, I think it's the pigment. Yeah. Interesting. Here's a question from Jay. Does eating lots of beans, peas, and lentils and grains weaken the kidneys? No, it does not. Um, I'm not, I've, I actually recommend patients to eat more beans, peas, and lentils and grains because they're not or eating those. What they're eating is, you know, chicken and steak and burgers and fries and pizza. I want them to eat more fiber rich foods, more plant protein. Yeah. Uh, Daria says diuretics for blood pressure. How do they affect the kidneys? Yeah. So diuretics are um, a medication. So for folks who don't know what they are, they are basically water pills. They, uh, they're called water pills because they make you pee more, even though your urine is not truly water, it's urine. Uh, but they call it water pills. Really, they should be called urine pills, but they're called diuretics. So diuretics can be useful to help get rid of the salt and water that sometimes causes high blood pressure for folks or that accumulates in people who have edema. When overdone, they can cause dehydration. So it's definitely a balancing act. So diuretics are available only through prescription because they need to be supervised by a physician. And I deal with diuretics day in and day out, multiple times a day. So I know all about them. <laughs> Interesting. Here's a question from a live viewer named Linda. What would you advise a patient on the carnivore diet who's a cancer survivor with one remaining kidney? I would tell them to seriously reconsider eating a carnivore diet. Uh, there's a lot of disadvantages to uh, eating a heavy animal protein diet, the acid level could accumulate. It's not just based on the blood test. Uh, urine pH could show a really acidic urine. Your phosphorus level could be high. Your blood pressure could be high. Your cholesterol could be high. Um, animal fat has been shown to contribute to insulin resistance. So there's a lot of risk factors or issues with eating a carnivore diet. Thank you. Ellen would like to know what causes kidney cysts? Some people have a genetic component for the kidney cysts. Uh, some people have a thing called polycystic kidney disease. I just saw someone with that today. Uh, generally, those folks know about it because it runs in the family, but other people just develop these cysts spontaneously, uh, like how some people have a mole or something. Uh, we don't know why they form. They just happen. And uh, some cysts can be problematic. They may have some bleeding or they might be cancerous. And some are what we call simple cysts that really cause no problems, don't need to even be monitored, don't even need to be checked. And, uh, um, and that's about it. Nice. When you changed your diet, did you like let all your patients and colleagues know or did you just kind of do it quietly? And I... I, I did it quietly initially when I first changed my diet because I think, and a lot of physicians have this concern that we might come off as being, uh, 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 we, it, it, we might be come off, come off being too strong or too passionate about something when we have someone who is very accustomed to the standard American diet. So that's why I said earlier is that I've had more success encouraging people to move along the spectrum than telling them that they have to eat plant-based or completely plant-based or go vegan or anything like that. Um, people are more receptive when they understand that they don't have to make a drastic change overnight, but they can start with small things and move in that direction over time. And I, and that, that's, that's more helpful. Have you seen any of your patients or colleagues move in that direction? Oh, many. Yes. Um, and it's, it's great to, to hear people when they make this change. I've had people uh, delay the need for dialysis um, uh, for months to years, even in some situations. And I'm not saying that this is for everyone. So, uh, but in some situations, when people make the right changes in the right circumstances, uh, it gives the body an opportunity to, to possibly heal. And it's great to see that. Nice. Uh, Suzanne is asking if somebody is already steeped in the standard American diet, would making a small step like even drinking more water even help? Yeah, of course. It, drinking more water helps with feeling better, helps with bowel movements, helps reduce the risk of kidney stones. Uh, it's it, If that's your first step, then you, you, you do it. Nice. Somebody is saying that they have, where did I go? Where did my chat go? 
Well, come on back. There we go. They already have kidney failure. What plant foods would be good for them? For those who have kidney failure, I'm assuming that means that they're on dialysis. Um, the, the Any of the whole unprocessed plant foods, um, those things you want to watch out for are your juices, sauces, dried fruit. Those can potentially cause high potassium levels. You don't want to eat processed foods, but you want to stick to the whole unprocessed fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, beans, lentils. Uh, those things are fine, and those things are going to give you the best opportunity to be healthy, reduce the number of meds you're on, and then qualify for a transplant eventually. Thank you. How many people, I mean, how, when people are on that list, I mean, that can take a long time for some people, right? Yeah, it's unfortunate for some people. It can be years depending upon the match that they are, the tissue type that they have. Uh, for some people are on it for five, six, seven, eight, nine years. Uh, and then some other people are able to get it sooner than that. And also depends on geography, how many people in your area are on the list. But if you know someone um, that cares about you a lot, they could be a match and they may be interested in donating kidney. So um, it's good to be friends with people <laughs> and it's good and it's good to ask them too. Somebody actually asked me for mine and I just didn't want to give it up at this point. And I'm curious for the person that's the donor, what's it like for them? Is that a painful operation as well? Uh, for some people it can be, and um, it, it's your right to say, to say no. Um, and, uh, and, uh, um, the donating a kidney it is not a small surgery. It is a big surgery. So there are a lot of things to take into consideration. This is something that we've published about before a few years ago and that uh, it can be painful. Sometimes things are uncovered by insurance. It can be costly, but things are changing. So people are understanding these issues. So whatever we can do as a society to make it easier for people to donate, we are trying to do that as a both a medical profession and as a society, because we know that when people donate kidneys, the people, the person receiving it lives longer. Uh, there's lower costs for society, healthcare costs, and it leads to a better quality of life. So we're trying to make it easier, trying to reimburse for those costs, giving tax credits for out of pocket expenses, getting insurance coverage. And then of course, and I was just talking about this today, if you end up donating a kidney and then you yourself need a kidney in the future, you rise to the top of the list. The system prioritizes you so you're not left stranded. That's very interesting. Are yeah. there certain people that, for whatever reason, even if they're a match, should not donate a kidney? People, uh, and usually the system will prevent you um, if you, there's some risk factor that you yourself might end up being on dialysis. So people who have diabetes, high blood pressure, have existing kidney disease, should not donate a kidney because they need to hold on to their kidneys um, uh, so those people generally get screened and are not allowed to move forward in the process. Uh, those are the, probably the big things. Yeah. And so does your own insurance have to pay for you if you're the donor? Cause that would just seems like the other guy should pay. My understanding is that the other insurance pays for it. That would make yeah. sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ellen said, why would a pregnant woman develop a painful kidney stone? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of changes that occur in pregnancy. Uh, 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 people may not uh, be as hydrated because they have a baby pushing up on the stomach. They get full of easier. Um, their microbiome is changing. Their diet is changing. Uh, maybe they feel uncomfortable going to the bathroom, so they're avoiding water. Maybe they're trying to eat more protein to meet the metabolic needs of having a growing fetus. So there's a lot of risk factors that can contribute to a kidney stone pregnancy. A lot of it's the same stuff that contributes to having a kidney stone uh, out of pregnancy. And then the, the way to prevent it is uh, uh, to to be mindful of the things that I mentioned earlier. Do you actually do the surgeries? I don't do the surgeries, um, uh, but they are fun. I've watched uh, a number of them uh, in my trading and uh, they are fun, at least for me. <laughs> <laughs> you have a peculiar way of having fun. <laughs> I used to be a respiratory therapist and we had to be in there for open heart surgery. I didn't think it was so fun, but... Uh... Anyway, Steph says, does protein total that is low indicate low protein in the diet? This is from a recent metabolic panel. No, it doesn't. That protein is different. Um, the only way to really know how much protein you're getting and if it's low or not is to either collect your urine for 24 hours or to just kind of 
keep a tally and look at the labels and estimate how much protein or to see a dietitian who can help you do that because they have software and programs to input how much protein and calculate it for you. How does smoking affect the kidneys? Smoking damages the blood vessels in the kidneys. The kidneys receive a lot of the blood that the heart pumps and the smoking damages the blood vessel in the kidneys that ultimately lead to those parts of the kidneys dying off over time. So smoking is bad. Definitely wow. stop smoking. One in two people who smoke die from smoking related causes. Yeah. What about alcohol? Good or bad for the kidneys? Uh, I would say neutral, but I don't want people to, well, actually my, my mentor, David Goldfarb at NYU always said that alcohol was good for preventing kidney stones because alcohol is mostly made of water. And that is true. Now, don't go crazy and start drinking beer and wine because it still has a lot of harmful effects, can raise blood pressure, increase the risk of GI cancers, uh, all these other things. So um, uh, there's a lot of other ways to stay hydrated. How common is kidney cancer in terms of cancers in general, other parts of the body? Not super common, but uh, some folks may be at increased risk, especially if the kidneys have uh, stopped working. We know people with kidney failure are at slightly, uh, a little bit higher risk. People who smoke are at higher risk. Um, and kidney cancer can also be difficult to treat. And a lot of people who end up with one kidney are, is, uh, are the reason being for that is because uh, they had uh, kidney cancer and had to have one kidney taken out. That's interesting. But you have to have at least one, right? You, you, you can't, can't give them both up. No, you cannot. You cannot give them both <laughs> up because then you'll be on dialysis or you'll need a kidney back very quickly. Absolutely. Uh, Deb wants to know, what is GFR normal range? And if your numbers are high, what can you do to bring them down? I'm overall in good health, just a bit overweight. GFR, uh, for those do, that do not know what this acronym means, is glomerular filtration rate. And this is roughly the percent kidney function. So a higher GFR translates into a higher percent kidney function, which is a good thing. Generally, most people are not trying to bring that GFR number down. They're trying to bring it up. Uh, but uh, um, and ways to, to do that are to eat healthy, exercise, take your medications, keep diabetes and high blood pressure uh, under control, prevent it if possible, see your doctor, uh, do all the usual things that we, we tell patients. The normal percent kidney function kind of varies because unfortunately through the aging process, we lose about a half percent to a full percentage point of kidney function each year of life, unfortunately. So by the time we're in middle age, we've lost maybe a third of our kidney function or more. And those who are older have uh, even less kidney function. But when you compare them to other people their age, they're about the same word for where they should be. So it's really kind of dependent upon age. Uh, but, uh, generally, um, if you're a younger person with low kidney function, that's bad. But if you're an older person with great kidney function or a high GFR, that's good. Nice. A uh, Gina says, how many years can a person actually live on dialysis? That also varies. And is a really good question. Uh, your audience has a, has a lot of good questions here. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, dialysis is really not living. It's, uh, the way to, I, view it is that it's actually that you're slowly dying, unfortunately, uh, which may be tough to hear, but it, dialysis is not equivalent to having a kidney. And for young patients, they can live maybe a decade or two. I've seen some people who were on dialysis at a young age and they make it into middle age, uh, but the life expectancy decreases a lot. There's a thousand fold increase in the risk of dying um, if you're young. Uh, uh, if you end up on dialysis. And then when you're older, the life expectancy on dialysis can be as short as uh, a few years. And I'll, I'll share my own personal experience, which I've never done before. My own grandfather was on dialysis and he didn't live very long, but only a few weeks to uh, at best. Wow, so sorry. Yeah. Um, have you talked about vasculitis and how it affects the kidneys and what the prognosis is? Yeah, so va there's a lot of vasculitides or different types of vasculitis and depends on the one that you have. Some are really bad. Some are not so bad. If you have a vasculitis, you definitely want to be seeing a kidney doctor and a rheumatologist. Uh, rheumatologists tend to deal with autoimmune diseases like uh, most types of vasculitis. And the treatment for that largely is immunosuppression, which can take the shape of steroids or chemotherapy, 
or biologic medications. Thank you. Um, she must have either tuned in late or not heard, but Renee's saying her son gave a kidney to a friend. He's healthy, mostly plant-based, but if he needed a kidney, could he get one to replace what he gave away? And you're saying they move you to the top of the list if you're a donor, right? Uh, they wouldn't give him, if he has a healthy kidney and he just wanted a second kidney, they wouldn't give him a second kidney just so he would have to, but say that kidney, that, that one kidney that he has now stopped working, they would move him to the top of the list that he would be prioritized to get a kidney himself so that um, he could avoid dialysis or reduce, minimize the amount of time he is on dialysis. You know how Dr. Esselstyn always promotes for his heart patients or just even in general people, you know, eating greens, you know, several times a day. Is there like a food that you particularly recommend for people with kidney disease or trying to avoid it? That, like, is, is there a kidney superfood, if you will? There is no kidney superfood. And I get this question a lot and I wish I had a, a better answer. But the beauty of it is that the answer is dependent upon you. What fruit or vegetable or plant food do you like eating? And I get different answers when I pose this question and I encourage people to eat what they like. Yeah, I like sweet potatoes. And go crazy. <laughs> I haven't got sick of them yet. I haven't had them every day for lunch. Rodna says, if you had a kidney transplant, how long will that kidney last? That's a good question. So if you, it depends on where you got the kidney from and how good that kidney was at the time of a transplant. And uh, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but roughly if you get a kidney that uh, from a, someone that was alive, like a friend or a family member or a relative that donates a kidney to you, that kidney can last for 20 years or more. And I've, I've seen that regularly. If you get a kidney off the waiting list, uh, you get someone that passed away, unfortunately, from like a car accident and that person died and they went to Harvest Oregon, then the kidney may last maybe a decade or a little bit more than that. And then do they need another one? And depending on, yeah, some people go for a second transplant because the kidney lasted 10, 12 years and then, you know, they're, they're still doing well and they go for a second transplant. I've seen that too. Did you ever watch that sitcom that was on for a while that was based on the uh, creator's real life of being on dialysis? It was, I can't remember the name of it, guys, help me out. But I'm curious, you, you hear these stories, is it true that when you take somebody else's body parts, sometimes you take on their characteristics? I have not heard, I, I've, I've seen that in stories. I've not uh, experienced that, but people say that they've feel some things. I don't know if that's really scientific. I don't know if anyone studied it, uh, but it's an interesting concept. And now that you mentioned, it, I will ask my transplant patients when I see them, if they've experienced this. Yeah. Cause sometimes you don't get to even know who your donor is, right. To thank them. It's right. Anonymous. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's a uh, John Doe that was on the highway and got in a oh. car accident. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, there's a question. Uh, he practices medicine. It's Orlando, right? At the VA. Right. In Orlando? Exactly. Okay. And we said that, and uh, Susanna says she had to severe toxemia in her first pregnancy. Could that have done any permanent damage to her kidneys? Possibly. It depends on the circumstances, how bad it was, how high the creatinine went, how long it lasted, what her kidney function is now. So there's a lot of variables that go into play, but that's a good question to ask her, her kidney doctor and see because that, that kidney doctor would have all those pieces of information in front of them. Thank you. There is a question uh, from Gwen. What is polycystic kidney disease? Yeah, so that, that refers to that inherited uh, cystic disease disease. Uh, that, that can occur in families. Uh, the most common one is the autosomal dominant where it's passed on to each generation uh, for the most part. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and a lot of family members have it. There's about a 50-50 uh, chance of passing it on to um, a child. And what happens is that the cysts occur at a young age and they grow and grow and grow. And then they ultimately destroy the kidney until the kidney basically becomes a uh, just a bunch of uh, small balloons or cysts, uh, and it destroys the kidney function. And people need dialysis. It's really unfortunate. Um, and a, a number of my patients have gone on to get transplants. Nice. Uh, there's a question from Debbie: Are muscle cramps a symptom of kidney disease? Uh, I get this question a lot and it, it may or may not be, depends on the electrolytes. There's a lot of reasons that people can get muscle cramps, um, could be from not stretching. It could be from, uh, restless leg syndrome could be from low electrolytes from a side effect of a medication, like a diuretic depends on a lot of things. 
but it's not always. Right. And is renal failure hereditary, asks Debbie? For some people, it can be. Some people are at increased risk. There are some genetic, uh, uh, some genes that can be passed down in families that increase the risk of developing renal failure. Uh, if you have any concern whatsoever, I would recommend uh, starting with your primary care doctor or even going to see a kidney doctor if you can, uh, if you have open access uh, insurance. Thanks. The show was called Be Positive and it was about, uh, it was a sitcom about a guy on dialysis, but you didn't see it. So you can't comment. But, but so now I, us, oh, Yeah, sure. now you can go wa- maybe watch it. Tell us about Afternoon Rounds. So that's my website. It's afternoonrounds.com. And I uh, try Uh, It's a big try to keep it updated and put resources, but uh, as time uh, eludes me as I uh, get older and have more responsibilities uh, personally and professionally, it becomes harder to update, but it's a good starting point. I put some papers on there, some videos, people have specific questions. There's a list of uh, dietitians uh, that are plant-based and understand the aspects of kidney disease. Um, I don't get paid from anyone or anything. It's just purely informational. Um, and so it's just a, 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 a stepping stone to further research. Well, thank you. And thank you for doing this. I know you worked all week and all day at the clinic, and I appreciate your time. Last question. If people want to know more about you, I know you're on social media. Which one is the best? How active are you? And things like that. If you speak anywhere, write any books kind of thing. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it uh, for you having me. Uh, uh, I'm a big fan, and this is nice to, to reach so many people and talk about my favorite topic. Um, I am mostly active on Twitter at SJoshiMD. I am on Instagram. I don't post so much on Instagram, uh, mostly because it started as a personal account, and now I don't know what to do with it. Uh, but I post a lot of papers that I like and stuff on Twitter. And if you have specific questions, you can reach out to me. I'll try to respond, but uh, uh, you should know that I can't give personalized or medical advice, but I can at least point you in the right direction. Is kidney your favorite bean? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, what do you do for fun? Do you have time to exercise or do any hobbies or anything? Yeah, I love to go biking. I love swimming. I love go running. I love uh, watching TV, even though that screen time is not so good. But uh, sometimes there's such good shows on Netflix and you got to watch you know, them. It's like, even if they never made another show, we I mean, we couldn't. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So what 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 if what have you been watching or what are you watching now? Any recommendations? Uh we were really into Stranger Things, so we're waiting for that to to come back out. And then the great great British baking uh bake off uh released a new season, so we're about to start watching that again. That's always fun. Uh it's mindless stuff, you know, at the end of the day yeah. to just kind of decompress, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Joshi. It was so fun getting to know. If you ever have anything to promote or want to come on again, do a PowerPoint or just chat, please know. And you get two free bottles of California balsamic vinegar just for being on the show. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoy this. Thank you, Chef AJ. Thank you. Thank you. You were delightful. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 9 a.m. tomorrow for Dr. Suzanne Bazone, or maybe it's Bazoni. She's going to be talking about what if you're following a perfect diet and not seeing results. Thanks again, Dr. Joshi. So nice to meet you.